Could you help me welcome to the stage tonight Pastor Evangelist, Apostle Prophet J.C. Jennings in the house. That was quite the introduction. Um, <laughs> okay. First, hi. How are you guys doing? Oh, man, I'm doing good. Okay, so first off, first things first, you learn this. Um, on behalf of uh, my family, we would like to thank the Lindsay family and uh, Pastor Adam and Jamie and all the wonderful staff and faculty, especially the ones that are still rocking it up in this place. Um, we just want to thank you guys from the bottom of our heart um, for not only having us, but for training up these world changers. Can you give your leaders a hand? <laughs> That's the first thing. Okay. The second thing that I want to do, because, you know, you try to remember this stuff, is uh, I did not come alone. Now, um, I brought uh, some of my family with me, and so I would like to uh, just let you guys know that my better half, her name is Anna, also a graduate of this place. Um, there's my beautiful wife right there, Anna. I definitely married up. And my firstborn son, Zach. Zach, right there. Go ahead and stand, Zach. Or I'll bring you up on the stage. So you just might want to stand and wave. Okay, so that's Zach. And then um, my other son, Micah, uh, had homework. So he's doing, like, the responsible thing. And then my daughter, who is, uh, she's speaking at our youth group tomorrow night. So she is studying to get her preach on. Hallelujah. And uh, so with all of that, I just wanted to get all that out of the way. Now, I am caught right now because I can do one of two things. I can give you a nice sermon, okay? Charlie, I'm up here. Stop talking. Okay, so I can give, yeah, gotcha, Charlie. Oh, I see you. Okay, <laughs> I can give you a nice sermon or I can be extra. extra. How many of you want a nice, calm, wonderful, easygoing sermon. How many of you want something a little extra? Okay, extra wins. Because my daughter, okay, my daughter, she looks at me with those teenage eyes, and she looks at me, and she's like, Dad, you are so extra. And I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, come on, give me a hug. She's like, no, Dad. You are so extra. Now, I want to let you know, that's my cue to be extra. That is my time to turn up the love, okay? Now, some of you, you don't have parents like this, okay? But I've let my children know. That if you act embarrassed of me, I will be extra. I will show up at your school. I will call Channel 8 before I show up so it can be documented across the world and make TikTok. And I am so ready one day for them to just be embarrassed of me. And you know, my son, he's wised up. He's always chill. My other son, he's always chill. But my daughter keeps dancing on the line. And the day's going to come where daddy's going to get to show up and show out. And I can't wait. Hear that, Malia? Daddy can't wait. <laughs> now some of you are like going, whoa. I want him as a dad. I know, really, I know that's what you're thinking. Okay. Um, and you're like, what does all this have to do with anything? It has to do with this. Isn't it interesting sometimes the way that we react and respond to authority figures? See, I was teaching 
today to a bunch of students, and these students had one Skittle too many, and they were going crazy. I mean, just crazy. Look at your neighbor and say, crazy. Okay? And they were just, I mean, going, going for it. And finally, I stopped the entire class, and I said, I just want to know this one thing. Why do you rebel against authority figures? I asked the question. Simple question, right? Why do you rebel against authority figures? And, the, and one was like, hold it, hold it. You mean like police? I was like going, sure. Another one was like, you mean like teachers? I'm like, okay, yeah. And one's like, hold it, hold it. No, no. It's adults. All adults. And I said, okay, why? A consensus of an entire class all came up with the exact same answer. They said, because we don't want to hear you. They're like, we got our own stuff to do. And we don't want to hear you. Exhibit A. We have a generation that has been tricked by the enemy to disobey and to rebel against all authority figures, including God. So what happens is here or anywhere, as a matter of fact, that you go, you are going to find a generation that now, rather than fighting for something, constantly wants to fight against. And so this generation is constantly wanting to fight against something. Henceforth, if you are going to have a rally for the right for women, they're going to show up and they're going to fight because it's against something. If it's going to be um, against the police, they're going to show up because it's against something. They will constantly fight against something because right now, even at a young age, they're looking at authority figures and saying, you know what? We don't need information from you because we can get it from Google. And so with that, right now, I'd like to let you know, in the schools right now, teachers are having more problems than they have ever had. Than they've ever had. More disrespect than they have ever had. Parents are having more disrespect than they have ever had. And guess what? The church is having more disrespect than it ever has. Because guess what? People, oh, I love Jesus, but I hate me, the church. So they're all up on hating the church, and they're going to make certain that they hate on it so much that they're going to make sure they do it to where it's funny. So you go ahead and you watch your little movie or you watch your little TV show, and they're going to make certain that they somehow make a way to make certain that the Christian is made fun of and the value systems of a Christian is made fun of. They're going to make certain that the church looks like it is elitist or it is completely out of touch what is going on in the world right now. We have a generation that can a thousand times over recite all the lyrics to an uh, Ariana Grande song and they can't recite one scripture. So what happens is that now we have a generation that they are responding to what they see, but guess what they don't see? God. And so when you don't see God, doesn't it make it a little bit difficult to have faith in him? I'd like everybody to repeat after me. Parazim. 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 So, there's a story. In 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. I'm going to do the old people thing. I'm going to put my glasses on. You know what I'm talking about, Pastor Adam. <laughs> it's all right. I'm older than him. 
And it says this, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they all went in search of David, but he heard about it and went down to the stronghold. So the Philistines came and spread out in the valley of Rephraim. Then David inquired of the Lord, should I attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, attack, for I will certainly hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim and defeated them there and said, like a bursting flood, the Lord has burst out against my enemies before me. Therefore, he named that place, the Lord bursts out. My very first point is that the Philistines already knew David because David lived with them. While he was running from Saul, he lived among the Philistines. The guy that was formerly a giant killer all of a sudden was living among the enemy. So then Saul finally lands up getting killed. And when he gets killed, David becomes the king of Israel. And now all of a sudden, all those frenemies show up and are going like, whoa, 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 whoa. He just got anointed king. Now we're showing up. We don't want him. We didn't mind him before, but now he is anointed. There's some of you in the room, the very reason why you are going through what you are going through right now is, is because you are anointed. And the enemy is gathered at your door to say, you know what? We don't want you to go one step further. We, knew, we used to know who you were. We remember you when you were in the club. We remember you in high school. We remember you in the back room. We remember you when you were smoking this or smoking that. We remember who you used to be. But now you're anointed and we don't like it. So guess what? We are here to tell you, uh-uh, no, we're not having it. David hears from God. He goes, should I go against him? And the Lord's like, yes, I'm with you. He goes against him. He defeats the enemy. And all of a sudden, after he defeats him, he declares, this is Baal Perizim. This is the Lord of breakthrough. Perizim means breakthrough. And David takes a stand to say, you know what? I heard from heaven. And because I heard from heaven, I'm going to follow what God tells me to do. And I'm going to go for it. And it was after they won, he said, this is my parison moment. Now, you would think, that's great, right? He defeated the Philistines. It's a done deal. Like, that's it. It's over. It's over. He won. But guess what? The enemy came back. They came back again. A second time. So, old man glasses. 2 Samuel 5, verse 21. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off and burned them. 22. The Philistines came up again and spread out in the valley of Rephraim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not attack directly, but circle around behind them and come at them opposite the balsam trees. When you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, act decisively, stir yourself up, for then the Lord will have gone out ahead of you to strike down the army of the Philistines. Okay. Okay. Let's go back a moment. The first time David calls on the name of the Lord, the Lord tells him, go against him. Push, push, push. Go for it. The second time the Philistines come, David goes to God again. And God looks to him or God says to him, this time I want you to go around them and come behind I want you to go around and come behind. Point number one, David had already beaten them once. 
But instead of relying on the old word and doing what had been done before, David went again to God, asked him a second time, and this time God gave him an alternate, a different directive. Sometimes we get so hung up on the first thing that the Lord said that we forget that God doesn't want us to just have a talk with him. He wants us to have a conversation. He wants it to be a continual thing. See, for all of you that have children, you'll understand this. If you're old like me, back in the day, okay, you got the talk. Okay? Some of you are like, the talk? What's that? Okay, the talk is when you're a kid and you're minding your own business, you know, you're not doing anything, and then all of a sudden your parent comes up and they want to talk to you about <clears throat> the birds and the bees. That's what they called it back then. Now they call it hooking up, Netflix, and chill, or whatever you want to say. That is, and all of a sudden your parent comes up, okay? How many of you in this room, once upon a time, your parents actually came and talked to you about, about this? Okay? That's about 20%. Okay, 20%. How many of you, when your parents came and talked to you about this, it was the last conversation that you ever wanted to have and you wanted to die? There you go. Okay, so you understand. Okay, however, in this day and age, the world is so messed up, you just can't have one talk with your child. You have to have a conversation. You have to have many talks with your child. And if you're a Christian, you want to balance what the Word of God says and what the will of God is concerning what the subject matter is. See, because if you go according to your preference and you don't go according to what the Word of God says, then guess what? Not only will you create a mini-me, but all the problems that you're going through right now, you will reproduce that in your seed. Oh, did he say that? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it was crazy. A long time ago, I taught here. And when I taught here, I had this guest speaker come. And this guest speaker came. And we had a third-year program. And the guest speaker came to the third-year program. And this is what he said. He said, if you were in the third-year program, I would like to let you know this one thing. This was brutal. He was like, if you were dealing with the same sin issues from the first semester that you are dealing with right now in your third year, you have failed as a Bible college student. He said, the very fact that the enemy can come at you and you are part of the army of God and you have not learned how to clothe yourself in righteousness, how to all of a sudden get up, pick up your sword, and tell the enemy where to go means that you have failed what God has called you to do in this place already. Wake up. I was like, ooh, he said that. And then I thought about it. How in the world can a Christian not grow? And it dawned on me. Because it can be really easy for this to be about a spirit of works and do's and don'ts. And the very reason why so many people rebel is because they all of a sudden get tricked into seeing that church is about do's and don'ts. If you dress this way, you're holy. You dress this way, you can take the L-Y off of that first part I just said. Oh, my daughter, she will straight up see something on TV, and she'll see a guy that's acting the fool, and she'll be like, that's a male Jezzy. That's what she says Jezebel. That's a male Jezzy right now. 
That laugh, male Jesse, straight up point him out, male Jesse. Because isn't it funny how girls can do stuff and they get treated badly. Guys do stuff and they get applauded. <laughs> oh, I can say a lot more, but my son is up in this place. Extra, extra. I really shouldn't say this. But men of God in the place, all the men of God, if you are a man of God, that girl should never ask you out. If you are a man of God, there is no such thing as double dutch, you pay, I pay, cheapskate. And ladies, ladies, if you don't like him, just call him, you know what, you're my brother in the faith. And then, and then leave him alone. I was called to preach the word, but man, I got some, I got some life points I could preach right now. Jesus. Okay. Let me go back to this. Let me go back to this, okay? Wow. Whew. Okay. Extra. Some of you want a breakthrough, right? Who want a breakthrough? I say, who want a breakthrough? Hey, you want a breakthrough. But before you get a breakthrough, some of you need to break down your anger issues. You need to break down your lust issues. You need to break down your control issues. You need to break down your obedience issues. Come on, somebody. If you want to be a man or a woman of God and you want a breakthrough, you got to step up your game. Fellas, oh man, I can't find the one. There's some good women up in this place. <laughs> oh man, I... Extra. Okay, so as I was saying, Parazim. Say Parazim. Say Parazim. The biggest thing about a Parazim moment, okay, is about being able to declare breakthrough. Is that breakthrough, sorry, your Parazim moment is not what happens, it's not what happens after the battle is done. Your Parazim moment is what happens the minute that you hear God. See, the very reason that a lot of, a lot of the church is having problems is because they're not hearing God. They're not taking the time to hear what God is asking you to do. So, the crazy part about that is that when God finally does ask you to do something, you freeze because you don't recognize whether it's his voice or not. And the minute that you freeze because you don't recognize that it's his voice, all of a sudden, you can miss out on his timing. 
because certain things are supposed to happen in a certain time. And God's timing is not your timing. It's his timing. So here's a great for instance, okay? I, um, I have that testimony. You know, that testimony, the one that people have that they don't think that it actually matters or means anything. I was saved at four years of age, sleeping under a pew, and got up and gave my life to the Lord and loved it so much every single Sunday, I kept going up for a salvation altar call because I wanted more tickets to heaven than everybody. And so now I'm gloriously saved. I got all the tickets. Yeah. And then what happens? Okay, now I'm 15 years old, and I'm up at a summer camp, and I almost drown. And when I'm going down in the water, and I know I'm not going to be able to make it back up, I say, Lord, if it's my time to go, then okay, I've accepted you. But if you have more for me, then God, please save me. And the Lord said, I have more. And a lifeguard grabbed me and rescued me. But you know what that moment did for me? It let me know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am saved. That Jesus loves me. That I have purpose. A life and death experience all of a sudden shot putted me into this place to where I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that if he forgave sins for you, he forgives sin, my, my sins as well. And you know what? It's all worth serving him. Everything that I've denied. Everything. So never smoke, never drank, never did the bop, bop, bop. I mean, nothing until I was married. Hallelujah, thank Jesus. I am letting you know that God is worth following all the way. That's my testimony. That is something that I'm like, you know what? I used to be ashamed of it. Because I always heard you do this, that, and everything else in the world, and then you get saved. And now people want to invite you up on the stage to preach. See, so you got to be a screw-up first. You have to have a breakdown so that your breakthrough is greater. You know what? My Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you know what? God does forgive you of every single sin. But if you are on that point right now of, oh, I really want to do this, but I think God has asked me to do this, then it's your parism point. It's your point of decision. And this point makes all the difference. Okay. If you are a Christian, raise your hand. Okay. Put it down. If you've dated a non-Christian, raise your hand up, put it down quick. Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. (laughs) It's okay, I saw you. Now, for all of you up in here, you're you're a Christian. You dated a non-Christian. Guess what? Their value systems were not the same as yours. And you hit a parison point at one point to where you're like going, do I follow God or do I keep holding on to what I'm holding on to? It happens to some people. Guess what? It is now legal to smoke the weed. And guess what? There are Christians that they're like going, well, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Hey! Okay. (laughs) Isn't your body also a temple, though? (laughs) Do you really think that, you know, Jesus is waiting to smoke the ganja with you in your temple? We want to have a moment to where we can say, this is our parison moment. This is where the Lord has burst through for us. But before that happens, we have to be willing to hear the sound from heaven. 
And when we hear the sound from heaven, the Lord gives us instructions and we hear his sound. That is all of a sudden when he goes ahead of us and starts taking care of everything. That's when the Lord bursts forth. See, the first time that he gives you direction, he just wants to know whether you are listening and whether you're going to obey. It says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So guess what? For some of you, your very first step, God called you to go to Bible college. God called you to work at this restaurant. God called you to go here or to go there. That was the first thing. But now all of a sudden, it all comes around again, and the Lord is saying, okay, perfect. I taught you the first time that I am for you. I taught you the first time when I provided your school bill. I, I taught you the first time when I gave you that car. I taught you the first time when, you get, when I gave you those roommates. And now all of a sudden, everything comes around again. And guess what? It is the same test. It is the relationship test. It is the money test. It is the ministry test. It is the pride test. It is the same test. He is brought back around. And if he did it once, he will do it again. Parism. Your defining moment is upon you. There are some of you in the room that, you'll be honest, hearing God for you has not been easy. It hasn't been easy. So, I would like to give you an example of what happens, okay, when you are going to God, and this is generally how a preacher knows. I know, I'm giving you like one of our little secrets, okay? This is how a, a preacher knows, okay? So I'm a preacher, and I'm coming in the altar. Somebody comes up to the altar. When they come up to the altar, and I say, okay, everybody, close your eyes and start praying. If your prayers are, oh, Lord Jesus, I just repent. You, you, you know what I did. <laughs> oh, Lord God, I'm just, oh, God. Forgive me, Jesus. Just forgive me. You know what that is to us preachers? We know you're dealing with a sin issue. We know. Instantly. Why? Because the minute that you come into the light of Christ, his light instantly reveals darkness. And it's so hard to hear from God when you're so busy complaining and ah, trying to let out something. It is like a child that is crying in Walmart that will not be quiet. Nobody can hear. Not the parent, not us customers, nobody. So it's hard to hear God. What's the easiest thing you can do? Deal with your sin. Take care of it. Jesus, I'm giving this to you. Please forgive me. And whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. But don't come up, drop your sin, go to take two, go to take two steps out the door, and then come back and pick it up again, and then walk out with it. <laughs> People are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Worship leaders do it all the time. Oh, Jesus. Woo. Oh, late in the midnight hour. I'm going to work it around. He's going to work in my favor. Woo, I'll give it all to you, Jesus. Oh, man, that just sucked. That was horrible. Man, man, I, man, he played that wrong note. Oh. A worship leader, do you, know, you think I don't know? This whole sermon is based off of David. David was as bipolar as you can get. <laughs> Read the Psalms. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. They all hate me. I want to die. <laughs> it's like reading some of your poetry. Come on. <laughs> Parism. 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 Breakthrough. You're like, okay, Pastor JC, you've been funny. You got my attention. 
I'm understanding. You're extra. You said some stuff that's kind of uncomfortable. Some of you in the room are like going, I'm not a Christian, but I totally agree. Like, whoa. Okay. It's, it's all good. So you're like, what's, what's the point? Hmm. What's the point? The point is, I felt the Lord saying that there are many in the room that you need to forgive yourself. That it's not the enemy's condemnation, but it's your self-condemnation that is consuming you. It's amazing. You can forgive somebody else really quick and then it's over. But all of a sudden you can say you forgive yourself. But meanwhile, you are on that uh, merry-go-round again and again and again and again and again. The enemy doesn't even need to attack you because you're doing a really good job all on your own. It says that the second time that God talked to David, he said, go around the enemy to the balsam trees, come behind them. Then it says to wait and listen for the sound of marching on the treetops. And when you hear the sound of marching on the treetops, stir yourself, act decisively, because it's time to go. Some of you are about to miss the moment. You're about to miss the moment. God has exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond, more than you can ask, think, or expect. But you are at your parison moment. It is a moment of hearing him and obeying in proper timing. Hearing and obeying in proper timing. The first time, they had to push. The second time, they had to pause. You know something about whether God tells you it's time and you've got to push or he's telling you, hold it a second, you've got to pause? Is that as long as God as your father tells you to do it, if God says, I want you to, I want you to go right now to Walmart and I want you to lead 10 people, tell 10 people about me, and you do it, and then he tells somebody else, I want you to literally go and I want you to sit on a park bench and I want you to watch the sun go down. If God tells one to go do this and God tells the other to go do this, guess what? If you're obedient, the payout from Jesus is the same. The payout for obedience is the same from your heavenly father. Because it says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So some of you are stressing so much about everything that you should be doing. God didn't make you a human doer. He made you a human being. Sometimes the best thing that you can do is that you can be. Sometimes it's not about the prayers that you pray, sometimes it's about you using your ears to hear. To hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. If the worship team could come roll on up here, make me sound holy. <laughs> this is the whole reason why I'm, I'm here is because this particular parison moment in your life is so key to what the Lord wants to do to break forth for you that you needed to know that it's time for you to increase your faith. Here's a story. This happened this summer. This summer, my son turned 16. And turning 16, 
he wanted a car. Evangelist. <laughs> Don't got that car money, you know what I'm saying? So, I did what any man of God would do, what any woman of God would do, join together and we prayed. We prayed to our good, good father that he would provide the need for a son. So one day, we go to Costco. Just down the road. Over that way. Okay. So we go to Costco. We're in there. And there's a guy that I'm friends with and, you know, kind of minister to him. And we're there talking. And all of a sudden, he was talking about, you know, wanting to, to, to be a giver. And I was like going, well, you know, in order to be a giver, you have to start um, where you're at right now. Because money only emphasizes who you are. So if you're cheap now, you'll be cheap when you got a lot of money. Okay, but if you give great now, you'll give great when you have a lot of money. Simple, just simple. And he goes, yeah, I know. He goes, by the way, do you know anybody that needs a car? I'm like, uh, my son's about to turn 16 and he needs a car. And he goes, yeah, I know. The Lord told me five minutes ago. I've got a car, I'll get it detailed, I'll have it to you in a couple of weeks. My son was given a 2005 Honda Accord for free by Jesus. That happened because somebody heard God. Oh, let me tell you another one. Our kids were going to go on a fine arts trip in Florida. And we needed a breakthrough financially because we, you know, used responsible money and had plane tickets and all the above. But we needed it for a family of five to be able to go on this trip. It was the, was it the day of? Day before. The day, that day we were like, okay, Jesus, um, we don't know how we're going to do this. And Lord, we've gotten out of debt and we really don't want to use a credit card, but our back is against the wall and we just don't have it. What do we do? So my wife looks in her account and all of a sudden she turns and looks at me and she's like, what did you do? And I was like, I didn't do nothing. Because you know, us husbands, we good at saying that. We didn't do nothing. Wasn't me. Okay. Okay. I mean, I thank God when a kid gets in trouble because it's not me. And so, she's like, no, seriously, what did you do? I said, I have done nothing. And she shows me. There's over $3,300 that showed up in our account. Turns out the IRS had made a mistake in our favor. And on the day that we needed it, it didn't come through the mail. It didn't come through somebody giving it. It all of a sudden came when we needed it at the exact moment of time the Lord provided. What did you do to get that? We tithed. We gave money to to Jesus because... It's all his anyway, and he only asked for a little bit of it. But the Lord loves his son so much that he made a way where there seemed to be no way. And if God is not a respecter of persons, if he did it for him, if he did it for us, he'll do it for you. If you would bow your head and close your eyes for me. If you're here and you've never given your life to the Lord, or you're watching online, you've never given your life to the Lord. You thought about it, you researched it, but it's never made sense to you that Jesus really, really loves you. 
I want to let you know from this preacher, Jesus really loves you. And if you give him your everything, you'll never regret it. Everybody in the room, please repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I give you everything. I give you my sin. I give you my pain. I give you my past. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch me and that you would make me brand new. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And Lord, from this point on, please be real to me because I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you said that prayer, welcome to the family. Now, you needed to, you needed to pray that prayer first because that particular prayer, those of you that do not know him, is the whole reason why you're here. It's the whole reason why that wonderful friend brought you into this place. But God loves us so much that he has something for everybody in this room. And in a second, those of you that have been in a point to where you're like going, ah, I'm just at this point of, it's this or that. God, I really want a breakthrough, but it just feels like everything keeps breaking down. Know that this time is for you. In this scripture, they had to hear the sound of heaven before they moved. Worship was so incredible. It was phenomenal. And yet there were still some of you that were so bound up that you were sitting out there. Didn't, weren't able to raise your hand because you didn't want to be fake. I get it. There's some of you that honestly had gotten really used to everything that you're like, you know what? And then there are some that you just flat out, I don't do that. I don't raise my hands. I don't dance. I don't sing. It's amazing how much you say that you don't do, and yet Jesus is supposed to be Lord of your Lord of all. Lord of everything. He wants all of you. He wants a total act of surrender. But 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 you know, I mean I I, I might go up if somebody's giving me a word. Jesus doesn't want a middle person. He wants to talk to you so that you know, that you know, that you know that it is him. Because when you leave this place, it's not going to be a preacher on a platform. It's not going to be an RA. It is not going to be Pastor Adam. It is not going to be any of those person. It is going to be you and the lover of your soul. And he wants to talk to you. He wants to meet you. So, I did what you asked. I was extra. But now will you do what he asks? Will you be extra? Will you do something that maybe you haven't done in a while? Will you all of a sudden come to the altar and say, God... If it's sin, deal with it. If it's a lack of maturity so you're, you're dealing with in, in, in the third year, something that should have been done in the first year, come up here, repent, and deal with it. If it's a decision that you need to make, you're at a perilous point, and you're like, God, I need a breakthrough, come up here and deal with it. Because the sound of heaven is in this place and God wants to meet you right here and right now because he loves you. You are worth it to him. He died on the cross just for you. He is coming back again to bring you home. But guess what? He doesn't want to wait just for that moment. He wants to meet you right here 
And right now, put your eyes on your feet. 